Today on the Matt Wall Show, Joe Biden declares that global warming is the greatest threat we face. But didn't he just say that white supremacy is the greatest threat? Which is it? Democrats keep cycling through different boogeymen and fear tactics. We'll discuss that. Also, five headlines, including the rehabilitation of Jeffrey Tubin, featuring perhaps the most cringe-inducing video of all time. No, not video of uh, not that video of him doing that, but a different video. And a young girl speaks up against gender theory in school. We have that video play. Plus, iHeartMedia puts out a job listing and declares that it wants, quote, diverse applicants only. Read, not white. Isn't that completely illegal? Finally, in our daily cancellation, we have the harrowing tale of Korean-Canadian sitcom stars who spent five seasons on a show, and now that it's over, they say that they were being victimized by racism the whole time. Hate it when that happens. That and much more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Whether he personally realizes it or not, Joe Biden is right now on a trip to Europe. Uh, Mostly so far, he's bumbled and stumbled around, speaking half intelligibly, allowing his wife to do much of the work for him. So not much different from his normal routine. But one part of his remarks to a group of U.S. Air Force personnel in England has caught some attention. He claimed that global warming is the greatest threat to the U.S. And more disturbingly, he said that the Joint Chiefs told him so. Listen to that. We must all commit to an ambitious climate action if we're going to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, limiting global warming warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, lead the global the global transition to clean energy technology. You know, when I went over in the tank in the Pentagon, when I first was elected vice president with President Obama, the military sat us down to let us know what the greatest threats facing America were, the greatest physical threats. This is not a joke. You know what the Joint Chiefs told us the greatest threat facing America was? Global warming. Because there'll be significant population movements, fights over land, millions of people leaving places because they're literally sinking below the sea in Indonesia because of the fights over what is arable land anymore. Global warming, our greatest threat. Countries are sinking under the ocean. The ice caps are melting. People are fighting with one another because they're so annoyed by how humid it is. I guess uh, we need our military to help fight climate change. Maybe they can invent some sort of laser to destroy the sun and cool things down a bit. Because ultimately, of course, the sun is what determines the weather and the temperature here on Earth. You know that uh, the giant 900,000 mile diameter scorching ball of gas burning at 10,000 degrees and which could fit a million Earths inside it? Yeah, that's the real culprit driving climate change, not your SUV, you egomaniac. I'm not sure what the military plans to do about it. Um, If it's not the destroying the sun, I don't know what it is, but it's interesting to hear Joe Biden call this the greatest threat we face. It was only a week or two ago that he made a very different um, assessment. He had a very different take on our greatest threat. As I said in my address to the joint session of Congress, according to the intelligence community, terrorism from white supremacy is the most lethal threat the homeland today, not ISIS, not Al Qaeda, white supremacists. There's that applause again. Just love that applause. White supremacists are going to kill us all. Amen. <laughs> Woo. Uh, white supremacists. So which is it? Are we are we all going to drown, or or are we going to be killed by roving gangs of Nazi clansmen? I need to know, Joe. What's it going to be? Maybe it'll be both. Maybe we'll be drowning and then the Nazi Klansmen will come up in their Nazi kayaks and finish the job. I don't know. This could be a tag team situation between global warming and white supremacy. Or perhaps white supremacy is causing climate change. That's how you thread the needle. And if you think that white supremacy causes climate change is too stupid, even for the modern day left, you haven't been paying attention. Here is um, Johnny on the spot here, an article on uh, the SierraClub.org titled Racism is Killing the Planet. And it reads in part, during the street protests and marches, many people carried signs that read racism is killing us. It's no exaggeration to say that racism and white supremacy harm all of us. Actually, that is an exaggeration. But anyway, because in addition to robbing us of our humanity, racism is also killing the planet we all share. An idea long overdue realization is growing in in the environmental movement. It goes something like this. We'll never stop climate change without ending white supremacy. This argument has entered the outdoor recreation and conservation space thanks to the leadership of black, indigenous, and other people of color in the climate justice movement. 
The pollution-spewing global megacorporations that created Cancer Alley are just the latest evolution of the extractive white settler mindset that cleared the forests and plowed the, the prairies. And just as the settlers had to believe and tell stories to de dehumanize the people they killed, plundered, and terrorized, today's systems of extraction can only work by dehumanizing people. Okay, well, that clears things up. Um, it's the extractive white settler mindset that causes all the problems. Come to think of it, I did hear the, the meteorologist on our local news here a few days ago mention that. He said that there was a, a heat wave coming, apparently, because a high-pressure system had moved up from the Gulf and had combined with an extractive white settler mindset. And now we can expect 90-degree temperatures through the weekend. Science is fascinating. What's also fascinating is to see Democrats sort of cycle through one fear tactic, one man-made panic after another. There's, of course, nothing new or especially interesting about politicians using fear to manipulate, generally speaking. They've always done that. Democrats certainly are not the only ones doing it now. But what makes this unique is just how many panics they try to cause, just how unsafe they try to convince us we are, especially in comparison with how safe and secure we actually are. I mean, in the past, politicians might pick one crisis, one boogeyman, and try to wring that for all it's worth. But Democrats these days aren't satisfied with one. They tell us that climate change is destroying the planet, sinking cities under the sea. We have less than 10 years to live. They tell us that a white supremacist army is prowling about, plotting and scheming, ready to strike at any time. They tell us that a rowdy group of trespassers in the Capitol were actually militant insurrectionists who came close to overthrowing the U.S. government by taking selfies at Nancy Pelosi's desk. They tell us that racism is an epidemic. It's killing thousands in this country every year. They tell us that racist cops are literally hunting black people in the street and murdering them for nothing every day. They tell us about a whole array of hate crime epidemics, especially hate crimes targeting trans people. And we haven't even mentioned the fear-mongering that caused millions of people to spend a year locked in their homes with muzzles over their faces. All of this, all at once, and I've only provided a partial list. So much fear, all the time. Such a dark and dreary vision of the world that we get from the Democrats. Meanwhile, back here in reality, life still contains its normal dangers, and you know we are still sure to die eventually of something. That's true, but for most of us, day-to-day -day existence is safer than it's ever been. We are more physically secure than we've ever been. Provided you survive the, the womb, of course, which is still a very dangerous place thanks to Planned Parenthood, and not counting the physical risks to children that they might be drugged and mutilated if they experience a little bit of gender confusion, gender confusion that was implanted in their minds. Um, so there are threats out there, serious ones. Some of them physical, many of them psychological and spiritual. But these Democrat politicians, they don't talk about any of that. In fact, they are largely responsible for much of that. Instead, they want you to fear the things that pose little danger to you. They want you constantly running from imaginary monsters. And then the idea is you won't notice the real threats when they come. Now let's get to our five headlines. Well, fortunately, we are getting a, a reprieve from some of the gift-giving holidays for a while, but there's a lot of other occasions you might have coming up for, for, for gifts, birthday, anniversary, wedding gift, whatever it is. And if you're looking for the perfect gift, um, Paint Your Life is it. This is a guaranteed hit. Paint Your Life. Uh, with Paint Your Life, you get a, a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. You can choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. We've been through this process twice now, and uh, that should tell you how we feel about it. It's a quick and easy process. You get a hand-painted portrait in about three weeks. I personally was shocked by how quickly, you know, originally I thought, well, maybe this will take a couple months or something, but no, just a few weeks. And uh, again, it just makes the perfect gift for someone else or for yourself. Um, and we, we, we are greedy, so we've gotten our Paint Your Life paintings for ourselves in our own homes. At PaintYourLife.com, there's no risk if you don't love the final painting. All your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get the special offer, text the word MATT to 64,000. That's MATT to 64,000. Text MATT to 64,000. Paint your life. 
Celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Again, text Matt to 64,000. Speaking of uh, threats endangering us all, you know, the cicadas we, we hear so much about, and it's been kind of a dud here in Tennessee for the most part. I, I haven't seen very many cicadas. And I was thinking about this last night. Uh, has anyone come up with a good cicada-related conspiracy theory yet? Because if, uh, it, do, I, do I need to work on that or has someone else done it? And, I, and I'm not saying what it should be, but it, it seems like someone by now would have something... Maybe, uh, you know, because cicadas aren't real. They're, it's a hologram. It's a distraction technique. Maybe cicadas are uh, tiny little government drones spying on us. We could work on it, but I, I really think someone... We don't have long here, and uh, we've got this once every 17-year event, and no one's come up with a conspiracy theory for it yet. we got to get on that. Someone's got to do it. All right. So this is really what we have to start with, I'm afraid, and it's not appropriate for children or, or for anyone, frankly, but Jeffrey Tubin, CNN legal analyst, obviously, as you know, um, showed his tube during a Zoom call with colleagues a few months ago. In fact, you know, he was, he didn't just show it. He was, uh, he was, you know, handling the situation, so to speak, right there in front of everybody on the Zoom call. And uh, it really kind of rubbed everyone the wrong way, as you might imagine. And he was fired for it. Or not fired. It, it, you, you'd think that you would be fired for that. Masturbating, you know, workplace masturbation. The kind of thing that you would think would get you fired, especially in the Me Too era. Well, that's not what happened. Because he's back now. He was back on CNN yesterday. And they, for some reason, decided to, on TV have a conversation about Tubin's masturbatory habits. And they brought a woman in, Allison Camerata, to have this discussion. This is, I think, the most cringe-inducing thing to ever air on cable news. I mean, it's all, I actually have not seen this entire video yet because I can't get past 15 seconds. It is so... It, the cringe is overwhelming. It's nuclear-grade cringe. This is a cringe comet. Um, an absolute volcano, an explosion of cringe. Well, I'm going to stop on that. I'm not going to go any further with that analogy. Anyway, let's uh, let's try. We're just going to try to watch this and see how far we can make it. Let's go ahead here. In October, you were on a Zoom call with your colleagues from the New Yorker magazine. Everyone took a break for several minutes, during which time you were caught masturbating on camera. Okay, stop. Can you stop? <laughs> I can't, it's, I can't go any further. Why are they doing this? And why is he sitting there? I'm asking why rhetorically. I know all the answers to my question. But so, why is he sitting there enduring this embarrassment? I know he wants his job back and everything, but he's been, how old is this guy? He's probably in his 60s now. He's been on TV a long time. Doesn't he have money saved up? How could you ever... How are you showing your face again? In, th imagine this guy walking through the hallways of CNN. He ends up in a break room grabbing a coffee with someone that was on that Zoom call. Like, hey, uh, how you been? Why would you want to endure that? There's no amount of money that could make that worth it. Go off into the, into the woods. Grow your beard out. You know, you, you can have all, just, you can do everything. You, you're out of sight. Do everything. Go ahead and do what you need to do out there. And live out the rest of your days. All right, let's, we're going we're gonna to keep going. We're going to try to make it through this. You were subsequently fired from that job after 27 years of working there. And you, since then, have been on leave from CNN. Do I have all that right? Um, you got it all right. Sad to say. Okay, so let's start there. Okay. Um, to quote Jay Leno, what the hell were you thinking? Well, obviously, uh, I wasn't thinking very well or very much, and um, it was something that was inexplicable to me. I think one point, I, I wouldn't exactly say in my defense, because nothing is really in my defense. I didn't think I was on the call. I didn't think other people could see me. You so, thought that you had turned off your camera? Uh, correct. I thought that I had turned off the Zoom call. Now, that's not a defense. Oh, okay. Wait, stop it there. First of all, inexplicable. 
His own masturbation was inexplicable to him. What is what does that even mean? He's looking down at himself, going, "What what's going on right now?" And then he says uh, he didn't know that the, his, his coworkers could see him. So what he's saying is, "Yeah, I was I was masturbating in front of my coworkers. I didn't, but I didn't know they could see me." And that, and that makes it okay. All right, how long is this video? Let's just let's just let's just make it through. Go ahead. This was deeply moronic and indefensible, but I mean that that is part of that that is part of the story. Um, and you know, I have spent the seven subsequent months, miserable months in my life. I can certainly confess, um, trying to be a better person. I'm miserable. in therapy. I think trying I think to do people some had to see service, that film. Jeffrey um, working in a food bank, which I certainly am going to continue to do. Working, working on a, a new book bank. about the Oklahoma City bombing. But I am trying to become the kind of person that people can trust again. Working in a food bank. I don't want this guy handling my food. The people that are going to a food bank, they've had, they're having a hard enough time, and now they got a, a chronic public masturbator serving their food? Oh, man. The whole thing is, is uh, I don't even know what to say. Probably I've said too much, as it is. But we, let, let's, can we be clear about, about one thing? Okay. As CNN tries to, oh, well, a couple things to be clear about. CNN is trying to re- rehabilitate this guy. Because he's one of their own, right? Um, this they would never do this, right? If, if this wasn't someone that they had a personal attachment to, they would never do this. Almost anybody else, their life is over for this. Certainly, you you lose your job for that. Like this is take me too out of it, take cancel culture out of it. In any normal scenario, you take your pants off and do that in front of coworkers. You're going to lose your job and you're not going to get it back. It doesn't matter what era we're living in. It doesn't matter anything. You're going to lose your job for that. But CNN is going to rehabilitate. Why is Louis C.K. is still persona non grata? He's, he's still in exile from polite society. How do you justify that if Jeffrey Tubin's allowed to come? At least Louis C.K. got consent first before he did that. Jeffrey Tubin didn't ask anybody. But also, another thing to be clear about is, yes, and somehow this has been lost in the whole conversation. He didn't know his camera was on. I, I believe that he didn't know the camera was on. I think that much is clear. But he was on a Zoom call in a work meeting. And he knew that. So he is doing that his, his plan was to do that while watching this meeting, right? He was, he was trying to do that during a meeting. That part was intentional. The unintentional part was that the camera was on. So I go back to how is that not a, fi- a permanently fireable offense? All right, let's, let, let's get away from this. We got to move on somehow. Somehow, some way, pick up the pieces and move on. All right. A little bit of a palate cleanser here. Here's another, uh, we'll go to Ron DeSantis. Here's another episode of Ron DeSantis being right about something. He was interviewed a few days ago by the Daily Caller. And um, uh, I really liked what he had to say here. I think we have the video clip. What advice would you give to American voters on how to tell the difference between a politician who's going to use their vote or who's actually going to fight the culture wars? Well, here's the thing on right to life. Uh, When I became governor, I inherited the most liberal Supreme Court in the United States. It was a four to three split by the time I became governor. uh, But I was able to replace three of the liberals to make it a six to one court. And that's important because Florida had the worst abortion jurisdiction uh, jurisprudence in the in the country way worse than even things like Planned Parenthood versus Casey. You couldn't even do parental notice. They would strike down almost anything, even with minors. It was it was crazy. So we've changed that. 
Now we've been able to advance pro-life legislation. Now some of this stuff is going to be uh, going to be tested in our state courts, but I think those precedents are uh, going to be reevaluated, and so we have an opportunity to do even more um, in the years ahead. And so, you know, I think it's something that is a fundamental issue. Uh, and I think here's what I tell people in terms of right to life: it's important, obviously, on its own. But the people that that aren't supportive of of the life cause. They're not people you want to be in a foxhole with on any other political battle as well. They're the first ones that will sell out to the D.C. establishment when the going gets really, really tough. And he's got the black cowboy boots also with the with the uh, with the suit, which is a bold choice. And I and I like that. Not really the point. The point is what he said there, which is exactly correct. This, this is another example, another episode of Ron DeSantis saying something that's true. Also, the kind of thing that every Republican should be saying, though few of them do because they just don't have. Um, the, uh, they, they, they either don't believe it or they don't have the guts to say it. And that's, this is exactly right. And I myself have been preaching this forever. As you know, that the, the life issue is one of the central battles, battlefields in the overall culture war. Um, and you need, you need that, you need to engage in that fight. You can't surrender on that issue because if you surrender on that issue, then you're surrendering on you're surrendering on the whole idea of, of life having inherent value. Or you give up on that and you say, well, whatever happens with abortion, it's not important. Not only are you consigning 60 million more babies to, to death and, and counting, but you're giving up on the idea that life has inherent value. And if life doesn't have inherent value, then I don't know what, I don't know where you go from there. What other, what other thing can you argue about? And what do you base your arguments in? If not a belief in the inherent dignity and value of human life. You can't go on to... You can't start talking about your, your rights on any other issue. You can't say, yeah, I don't know if human life has any inherent value or dignity. Uh, but our, our Second Amendment rights, those are really important. Why are they important? If your life has no value, then who cares if you can protect your life or preserve it? And what are, what are your, this right you're speaking of, where does it come from? So that's exactly right um, as far as the issue itself. And also, it is a good litmus test. And pro-lifers have always known this. You know, it's not that we think that abortion is the only important issue. It's one of the most important. But we also know that it's a litmus test. And we know that if we can't trust someone on that issue, we can't trust them to fight it and to be consistent, then you can't trust them on anything else. All right, another encouraging video we could play for you. This is from Fox. It says a 14-year-old in Virginia is speaking out about what she says is a sexist move by the Loudoun County Public Schools to allow boys into girls' locker rooms. The policy followed a previous... Um, a previous one that committed the, the county to providing an equitable, safe, and inclusive working environment regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity and other individual characteristics. The more recent proposed policy states in a draft that students should be allowed to use the facility that corresponds to their gender identity. Now, we've seen a lot, we've seen a lot of videos from school board meetings, especially Loudoun County, where they've, they've really been fighting this out. But I wanted to show you this. This is Jolene Grover, who got up and spoke, and she's wearing a, a shirt that reads, Woman is Female. So she is answering my infamous question, what is a woman? She has an answer for it, and I like her answer. I also like everything else she has to say here. Let's listen. Two years ago, I was told policy 1040 was just an umbrella philosophy, and you weren't going to allow boys into the girls' locker rooms. But here you are doing just that. Everyone knows what a boy is, even you. Your proposed policies are dangerous and rooted in sexism. When woke kids asked me if I was a lesbian or a trans boy because I cut my hair short, it should tell you these modern identities are superficial. My guidance counselor's response to my concerns about bathroom privacy and safety was, well, there are stalls in the bathrooms. Now boys are reading erotica in the classrooms next to girls, and you want to give them access to girls' locker rooms, and you want to force girls to call those boys she. You do this in the name of inclusivity while ignoring the girls who will pay the price. Your policies choose boys' wants over girls' needs. And we'll look past the fact that she's being forced to wear a uh, face mask there for no reason. But here is, what do we say, 14-year-old girl 
an eighth grader, and she is teaching these adults about basic biological science. Now we need children to stand up and tell adults and speak common sense to adults, educate them. What's the... I go back to, again, why send your kid into an environment where they're going to have to teach the teachers? You're not even sending your kids into school to be taught anymore. They have to be the ones doing the educating now. The teachers are the ones in school. They have to be, they have to learn about these things. And so here's just one. Now, we don't often hear, and this will be something that's often pointed out by the left, that you know, we don't often hear a, a, a lot of young girls standing up in front of microphones and speaking out against this kind of thing and actually saying, I don't want boys in the locker room with me. We don't hear it that often. Why don't we hear it? Is it because they, they're all okay with it? Is it because none of them value their privacy? No, it's because they're kids. And most kids, forget about kids, most people, most adults don't have the courage to do what Jolene Grover did just there. Especially kids don't have it. And the difference between kids and adults, as far as that goes, is kids have an excuse because they're just kids. And they shouldn't be put in this situation to begin with. I mean, kids should not be in a situation where they have to stand up and, and actually explain why they don't want boys in the girls' locker room. So I don't blame the kids who remain silent in that situation, but most do because they're afraid. Obviously. I mean, this, this whole idea that, well, the kids aren't complaining, most of them anyway, and the ones who do, they're bigots. Most of the kids aren't complaining, so sure, they must be fine with it. No, obviously, this is a, a view held by any rational person. And the kids who don't feel that way, it's because they've been berated into believing that they're not supposed to feel that way. Think about the situation a lot of these young girls are in. They're made to feel guilty for wanting privacy. If they, if they want basic privacy and security, the basic privacy and security that we all had in school and growing up, and it was never an issue, we never had, never had to even think about it, right? If you were a, a girl growing up and going to school in the 90s, you went into your locker room, there was no notion that any guys would be in there. And if they did, they'd be tossed out and suspended. So that was something you had, that was something we all had, didn't have to think about. And now it's an issue. And I think there are a lot of kids also that are being, they're, they're, they're being psychologically beaten down and indoctrinated. And they have this obviously natural desire for privacy and security like anybody else would. Uh, but now they're made to believe that that is, it's somehow bigoted. And they have to resist that within themselves. That it's their fault. The problem is on them. That's what they're telling girls. So they're saying to like 13-year-old girls in a locker room. Oh, if this boy comes in and you don't like it, you're the problem. You are the problem. There is something wrong with you, not him or her, quote unquote. All right. This is from CNS News. It says an executive producer at America's largest owner of radio stations, iHeartMedia, advertised a job Thursday by stating, we are looking at only diverse hires at this time. Only diverse hires, quote unquote. Molly Socha, executive producer of custom podcasts at iHeartMedia, made the statement in an email sent to a list serve um, interested in the New York City radio industry and obtained by CNS News. Socha said, quote, diversity is incredibly important to our team and our company, so we're looking at only diverse hires at this time. While the iHeartMedia media producer made this stipulation in her email, it apparently is nowhere to be found in the public listing for the job. Instead, the public announcement states, that iHeartMedia is an equal opportunity employer and will not tolerate discrimination in employment on the basis of race, color, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, religion, disability, ethnicity, national origin, marital status, protected veteran status, genetic information, or any other legally protected classification or status. Which is, of, of course, exactly what they're doing. This is a violation of equal opportunity employment. They're saying uh, that 
because we could translate this, of course, when they say we're only looking for diverse hires, uh, in other words, we don't want a white person. And so in order to ensure diversity, they're eliminating ahead of time an entire category of people. They are, they're, they're, they're limiting the number of people or the pool that they're going to select from in the name of diversity. Narrowing it down in the name of diversity. And the whole idea that a, that a, a person can be diverse, I, I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean. You've got a diverse person versus an undiverse person or a non-diverse person. Here's an update to this story, though, posted last night. Socha emailed the uh, NYC radio listserv shortly after being contacted by CNS News with the following statement. I made an error in language in my last note, so I just want to clarify, all are welcome to apply and we will consider all qualified candidates. That being said, in our efforts to elevate diverse voices in the predominantly white podcast space, we strongly encourage engineers, editors of color, regardless of gender and sexual orientation, to apply. Yeah, that's a little too late for that. You, you made an error in language. No, you didn't. You expressed what you're looking for. That's not an error in language. It's not an error at all. That's actually not a mistake. You were being very clear about what you wanted. It, it should be too late for that. I mean, there should be a lawsuit against, a massive lawsuit against iHeartMedia for this. Just like there would be if they sent out an email saying, you know, we're really looking for a white employee on this one. That's really what we're looking for. You think they could send out that email and then the next day or a few hours later say, oh, no, 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 uh, no, no, we, yeah, we, we'll, we'll consider non-white employees also or non-white applicants. No, they've, they've revealed their intent. And that should be enough right there. All right. One other story I wanted to mention very quickly. This is from the Daily Mail. It says, Kim Jong-un calls K-pop a vicious cancer and threatens anyone caught listening to it with 15 years in a labor camp. I didn't read the entire story. That's all. I just, I just read the headline. K-pop, obviously, is Korean pop music, like boy bands and stuff. He says they're a vicious cancer. And all I'm going to say is broken clock and all that. Uh, I got to agree with him on this one. I'm on his side on this one. 15 years in a labor camp. Might be a little lenient, though. Let's go now to reading the YouTube comments. This is from Taijin Paxton says, The thought of Matt Walsh twerking makes me laugh like Kamala when she's asked a question she doesn't want to answer. Laugh? Why would me expressing myself through the medium of dance make you laugh? You're banned from the show. Jopa says, how is it possible that Matt has less than half a million subs? Come on, folks. The guy deserves a million subscribers. Yeah, I agree. Where do you all get off not subscribing to me? What are you trying to prove exactly? What's your deal? If you want to be in the sweet baby gang, you need to subscribe. If you're not in the gang. Um, Luke says, the first rule of sweet baby gang is we don't talk about sweet baby gang. Well, then why are you talking about it, Luke? And um, gibberish... The username gibberish says, Matt, start an OnlyFans and twerk for money, then give the money to Abuela. You know, there are limits to my philanthropy, and you've, I think you've probably identified them. Actually, I've gotten so many requests over the last week with people asking me to start a GoFundMe for this or that. I should just announce right here that I am, I am stepping back from my philanthropy for a while. I'm kind of retiring from philanthropy in order to focus on amassing wealth just for myself. So... That's where my focus is going to be on. It's going to be for a while. Mark says, I like listening to Matt, but I generally disagree with, his, with most of his takes on officer encounters. Everyone knows it's easy to be a Monday night quarterback without thinking about things in the moment. I think Monday morning is usually when people do the, the quarterbacking. While I will not say it was right or wrong for the officer to use the pit maneuver on that vehicle, I will say that he did pay attention to his surroundings. He's referring to, we played the video yesterday, there was a pregnant woman... Um, this is in Arkansas. She was driving along on the highway at night. She was going 84 to 70. Officer tried to pull her over. She thought she didn't have room in the, in the shoulder, so she moved over to the right lane. She put her hazards on. She slowed down. She was looking for an exit. She went for about two minutes looking for an exit, and the officer decides to pull a pit maneuver, hitting the vehicle, 
and she flipping it, this is a pregnant woman, on the highway because she didn't pull over in a, to, to a reduced shoulder within two minutes. She, he just flipped the vehicle on the highway. Mark says that he's, uh, he's basically okay with that, it sounds like. Anyway, I'll continue with Mark. He says the only vehicle to have been damaged was the suspects. The suspect. She was going 14 miles over the limit. Suspect. The only, uh, uh, in hindsight, it's easy to make a judgment that this was just a civilian who was caught speeding, but for the officer, there was a chance that it could have been something more. Had it turned into something more and the officer didn't stop the vehicle before it got into more congested traffic, then this would have been a different story. The woman had ample opportunity to pull over on the side uh, as the traffic appeared to be low, but she chose to keep going. For an officer, all you have is a split second to make decisions that can go horribly wrong or positively right, which is why there's a saying that the sugar can turn to crap real fast. Is that a saying? I actually haven't heard that saying, but I like it. Um, yeah, Mark, I, I think you're just complete. I, I don't buy that at all. First of all, I'm not sure why you say you don't agree with my take on officer encounters most of the time. Most of the time on this show, when we're talking about an officer encounter with one of these high-profile incidents. I'm defending the officer. So it seems like you probably would agree with me most of the time. On this one, I don't defend the officer. I think the officer obviously should be fired, and probably there should be criminal charges as well. Because this is negligent at a minimum to flip someone's car because they didn't pull over within two minutes when they signaled that they were complying and they were looking for a safe exit. And you should remember, Mark, I, sh I, I read for you a document um, from the Arkansas Department of Public Safety. And they tell you, what, what do you do if you're on the highway and, and you're getting pulled over? Put on your emergency flashers and look for a safe spot. She did exactly that. She followed the protocol and he flipped the car because it wasn't fast enough. Come on. No way is that a, no way is that defensible. I, I defend police officers all of the time or most of the time because most of the time when there's a high profile police encounter that's on video and then, and then it's out there on social media and there are protests and everything, Notably, there are no protests over this, by the way. That couldn't have anything to do with the fact that the woman was white, could it? But in, in most of those cases, the officer is being unfairly maligned, and so I'll defend them. That doesn't mean you defend the officer reflexively every single time, no matter what. Yeah, you, you can't use the, oh, he only had a split second thing here. He didn't have a split second. This was a, this was a very low stakes normal sort of thing. He's pulling someone over. They're just going 14 miles over the limit on an empty highway. We've all done that. There's no reason to assume that there's something more going on just based on that. Um, and the, the car was signaling that it was complying. And just because it wasn't fast enough for his taste, doesn't mean that he could put her life in jeopardy and flip her car. I thought that's something we could all agree on. But, of course, we can't all agree on anything these days. You know, it's no secret that the amount of content from The Daily Wire is growing rapidly, both in numbers and in quality, from our new investigative journalism to our sports column to my now incredibly altruistic and generous podcast where I save abuelas purely out of the kindness of my heart and for attention. There's so much to see, hear, and read that even the most avid Daily Wire member might not be keeping up. You can now get all of that on the Daily Wire app. Even if you're not a Daily Wire subscriber, you'll be the first to know what's trending with mobile notifications for the latest news and all of your favorite content only a touch away. So download the Daily Wire app and you can stay up to speed with the freshest conservative voices around no matter where you are. And speaking of staying up to speed, if you're looking for a permanent cure for what medical professionals are calling whiteness, you're not going to find it in my weekly newsletter. In fact, you'll probably find an abundance of the opposite. If we're going off the fantasies of what that ailment is supposedly is, you'll also find some tips, fun facts, updates, and potential comments about twerking as a defense mechanism. I mean, there are many things in it. It's really just a rambling stream of conscious. I don't know if this is if selling it very well, but uh, still, you want to sign up for my, for my newsletter. Um, so head to dailywire.com slash Matt Walsh report. We just started this newsletter now. And um, already we got a lot of people signing up for it. So again, that's dailywire.com slash Matt Walsh report and subscribe to my newsletter right now. Right now! Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we begin with the stunning revelation that they have TVs in Canada, apparently. 
They even have their own TV stations and TV shows. That, to me, was the biggest news to come out of a recent report from the LA Times about controversy surrounding the show Kim's Convenience. Evidently, Kim's Convenience is a Canadian sitcom featuring a number of uh, Korean Canadians. And the show has now ended after five seasons, which brings to mind the old proverbial question, if a show airs on Canadian TV for five seasons, did it ever really air at all? We'll leave that to the side and get to the article, because as it turns out, many of the actors on the show have decided now, after five seasons, that the whole thing was terribly racist. Reading from the LA Times, it says, Kim's Convenience has officially closed up shop, and its stars are opening up about their frustrations with the show's approach to Korean-Canadian representation behind and in front of the camera. After the hit CBC sitcom debuted its fifth fifth and final season last week on Netflix, actors Simu Liu and Jean Yoon voiced their concerns regarding the series' overwhelmingly white production team, horse poop pay, and overtly racist storylines, among other alleged grievances. Oh, I see. After the show had finished filming and the checks were about to dry up, that's when the actors bravely stood up 65 episodes and five years later to denounce the overt racism. See, they've already made it so that if their claims of racism are true, then they are self-serving cowards who cooperated with it and went along with it for the sake of cashing checks. Best case scenario for them is that they are merely spineless, selfish, gutless money grubbers. Or... They could just be full of crap. I'll let you be the judge. Actually, I'll be the judge, but you could be the judge too. So what sort of racism could there have been? This was a show about Korean people featuring a cast of mostly Koreans. What complaints could they have? We'll keep reading. It says that Simu Liu, one of the actors who now has a deal to star on a Netflix Marvel series, quote, expressed disappointment with the way that he and his character were created as the series... um, Uh, were treated, rather, as the series progressed. He said, quote, I was, however, growing increasingly frustrated with the way my character was being portrayed, and somewhat related, was also increasingly frustrated with the way I was being treated. He then complains that a non-Asian actress on the show will be getting her own spinoff. Remember, this dude is going going into Marvel, okay? He's making Marvel money, but he's resentful that a white woman might be having a little moderate success of her own. He says, quote, of that woman, I love and am proud of Nicole, and I want the show to succeed for her, but I remain resentful of all the circumstances that led to the one non-Asian character getting her own show. And not that they would ever ask, but I will adamantly refuse to reprise my role in any capacity. I mean, he reprised it five times for five seasons, but now he adamantly refuses. Right after he got the the Marvel deal, now he, I am putting my foot down. I am going into Marvel. I'm not going to do this Canadian sitcom anymore on principle. But yes, he loves uh, his friend, Nicole, and is proud of her. It's just that that he's also resentful of her career success. If this is how he treats people he loves and is proud of, I hate to see what he does to people he hates. And from there, Lou and other actors on the show complained that they were grossly underpaid and unappreciated, and everyone was mean to them, and it made their tummies hurt. Also, they say there was a lack of diversity. Now, given that this was a show of mostly Asians, when they say lack of diversity, do they mean that there was a lack of diversity in the sense that there should have been more non-Asians? No, of course not. They say now that there were too many whiteies in the writer's room. Quote, the scene partners also addressed the alleged absence of diversity on the Kim's Convenience writing team, which, quote, lacked both East Asian and female representation, as well as a pipeline to introduce diverse talents, according to Lou. Aside from Inns, he's the guy who made the play that the show is based on, there were no other Korean voices in the room. And personally, I do not think he did enough to be a champion for those voices, including ours. When he left, without so much as a goodbye note to the cast, he left no protege, no Padawan learner, no Korean talent that could have replaced him. As an Asian-Canadian woman, a uh, Korean-Canadian woman with more experience and knowledge of the world of my characters, the lack of Asian female, especially Korean writers in the writer's room of Kim's, made my life very difficult. And the experience of working on the show, painful, according to Yoon. Very difficult, you see. Painful. There are people out there struggling with cancer, hunger, disease, despair of all kinds. But her life was very difficult because the hit sitcom she starred on didn't have enough Korean women in the writer's room. This is something to think about the next time you're tempted to believe that your own life is hard. 
You know, maybe you lose your job. Maybe you lose your marriage. Maybe you, maybe your house burns down. Well, before you complain, think about Jean Yoon, the underpaid sitcom actress with too many white people in her writer's room. I mean, that ought to put your own trials and tribulations in proper perspective. So what can we learn from this? Well, uh, nothing really. I mean, we should already be aware of the lessons here. The first is that our current environment of full-on racial hysteria has made it incredibly easy for one grifting con artist after another to line up and take advantage. It's been, de- it's been declared that a person of color, quote-unquote, cannot possibly be, r- be wrong if they claim that they're victims of racism. It doesn't matter how privileged they are. It doesn't matter how powerful they are. It could be a literal billionaire like Oprah. Doesn't matter. If they say they're a victim of racism or a victim of any kind, we must not risk invalidating their life, their lived experiences by asking any questions, let alone denying their claims outright. The other lesson is, once again, and most importantly, it's never enough. Nothing is ever enough. The racial grifters cannot ever be satisfied because the whole grift is to not be satisfied. You know, the irony of Batman is that he needs the Joker. Well, the SJW types, they need racism. That's their supervillain. They need it to justify their whole worldview. And just as the Joker is a fictional character, the vast majority of the time, the racism that they're fighting against is also fictional. And that's how you end up with an entire show about Korean people starring Korean people, and yet still somehow it is racist against Korean people. And it lacks representation of Korean people. That was always inevitable. The end result is baked into the cake from the start. There will never be a time when they say, okay, you know what? We've actually done a pretty good job addressing the racism thing. It's not a huge problem in society anymore, and we could probably move on to other issues. That will never happen. It can never happen. Because the claim of racial victimhood is where the race hustlers derive their power. And that's why you might as well stop trying to appease or satisfy or cooperate. You'll always be called a racist. Those who would accuse you of racism will still accuse you no matter what you do. All you could do is throw up your hands and say, whatever, I don't care anymore. I'm not playing this game. And also you can say, of course, you're canceled. And we'll leave it there for the day and the week. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Talk to you on Monday. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Sasha Tolmachov. Our audio is mixed by Mike Koromina. Hair and makeup is done by Nika Geneva. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Hey, everybody, this is Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon's turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the fall of the republic with me, Andrew Claven. 